There's clearly a lot to explore throughout Cyberpunk 2077's dystopian future, but much like Night City's Shining Towers and Mega Scrapers, CD Projekt Red's new sci-fi adventure has some deep foundations. With 30 years of lore behind it, there's a lot to catch up on, whether you're a complete newcomer to the Cyberpunk universe or a tabletop veteran looking for a refresh. So to that end, here's a relatively brief history of the Cyberpunk world before 2077. Now, there's nearly a hundred years of history to get through, so we gotta skip over some of the small stuff. For a much more detailed timeline, you can check out the full written version of this on IGN.com. Also, even though this video only contains information that's already publicly available, it does get into what some of you might consider spoiler territory, so consider yourselves warned. Even though 2077 is set 50 years from now, the cyberpunk universe really gets its start in the late 1980s. The world starts unraveling pretty quickly after the Reagan administration, as the US government gets taken over in a secret coup by the FBI, CIA, NSA, and the DEA, more commonly known as the Gang of Four. Now, this shadow government goes pretty much full bore on the whole profits over people thing. Along with a combination of plagues, wars, climate change, worldwide economic meltdowns, and natural disasters, it ultimately leads to a complete collapse of the United States as we know it in the mid to late 90s. One in four people are homeless, and most cities have been abandoned, leading to the rise of mobile communes, Think like if a whole trailer park started driving around altogether. And these would eventually become what's known as the Nomad Plans, and several states like California and Texas secede from the US to become free states. Now, the rest of the world fares a little better through the end of the 20th century, though not necessarily by much. The European Union, known as United Europe in fiction, remains fairly stable despite global market crashes, resulting in the Euro dollar, or EDI, emerging as the ranking global currency. South America manages to drive out U.S. troops after a bunch of resource wars, disease and food shortages crop up all over the planet, and most of the Middle East is turned into a glassy, radioactive wasteland by small-scale nuclear war. And because nobody fares better in the wake of a global disaster than multinational corporations, by the early 2000s these megacorps were operating on the scale of first world nations, with just as much, if not more, control over the world's governments and resources. The major players are the energy conglomerate Petrochem and their Soviet counterpart Sovoil, bioengineering firm Biotechnica, arms manufacturer Militech, and of course the it only does everything but mostly private military contract and granddaddy megacorp Arasaka but we'll get back to them in a bit. And look, none of this is to say this millennial era was entirely bad. The Central African nations unite and develop a highly successful space program, a new, more efficient fuel source is developed, and while the staggering amount of wounded vets in the early 90s was tragic, that catapulted technological innovations in prosthetics and biomechanical integration to new heights, resulting in the development of the cyberware that becomes so ubiquitous throughout the 2010s and 20s. However, along with cyberware came, naturally, cyber warfare and cybercrime, and plenty of other morally ambiguous uses for such revolutionary tech. Look, in a world where kibble has replaced 70% of the food market, it's no wonder that a ton of people took an extreme path towards getting ahead in life. And these cybered up hellraisers for hire, whether street kids or corporate wannabes, eventually became known as edge runners, or sometimes, more commonly, cyberpunks. And this is where we get into more serious spoiler territory, so if you really want to go into 2077 completely fresh, bail out now. In 2013, unironically named rock star and cyberpunk Johnny Silverhand is leaving a gig with his girlfriend Alt Cunningham when they're jumped by a corporate hit squad. They leave Johnny for dead and kidnap Alt, dragging her back to Arasaka HQ. You see, as it turns out, the Megacorp isn't particularly satisfied with being one of, if not the, biggest multinational corporation in history. They're pretty much bent on world domination. And what Johnny doesn't know is that Alt was a really extraordinary netrunner, a hacker, who had designed a legendary bit of malware known as Soul Killer. It was originally built to transfer a person's consciousness into a cloned body, but the program had been weaponized, and not just as a means to fry a target's brain, but as a way to imprison and torture souls digitally. It's nasty shit, and Arasaka captured Alt to make it even nastier. Meanwhile, Silverhand survives and gets together a rescue team, setting up an impromptu show outside Arasaka Towers and inciting the gathered crowd into a riot as a means of getting inside. At the same time, Alt reprograms Soul Killer and jumps inside the net to make her own escape, but the two plans collide in basically the worst way possible. Johnny and his crew blast their way into Arasaka, inadvertently cutting off Alt's retreat back to the real world when a burst of gunfire severs her connection to her physical form. Thinking her dead, they make their escape, leaving a disembodied Alt trapped floating in cyberspace. As the name implies, there'd been three previous wars between competing megacorps prior to the 2020s. I mean, when a company operates with the GDP and military force of a small country, the fight over corporate dominance is bound to get ugly. 
but these were all petty squabbles compared to the fourth corporate war. It started innocently enough in 2021, as a competitive takeover by rival oceanic shipping firms. However, as things escalated, each side hired one of the two biggest PMCs, Arasaka Securities and Militech, who'd been just itching for an excuse to duke it out for years. Before long, the war had ravaged the planet and pushed most countries to their breaking points. Almost all transglobal shipping had been shut down, the orbital colonies had declared independence to get out of the conflict, and the entire net was wiped out when Arasaka's assassination of renowned hacker Raish Bartmas released a virus that infected nearly 80% of all cyberspace, crippling corporate and governmental entities alike. Night City ended up being ground zero for the end of the war. As a free city and a free state, both Militech and Arasaka had strongholds there. And without a national government to hold them accountable, the city was a hotbed of continuous fighting between the two. Finally, in August of 2023, it all came to a head when a small-scale nuclear device went off at Arasaka's headquarters in the city center. Heads up, we're getting into more potential spoilers right now if that's still a concern. The specifics of what happened during what would become known as the Night City Holocaust are hazy. And of course, by hazy, I mean that 2077 might just completely retcon all the old tabletop adventures. But I'm going to assume those books are mostly gospel, especially because they just released a new one. There was never an official ruling as to who set off the nuke. The two leading theories are that Militech got overly bloodthirsty as the war reached fever pitch, or that Arasaka nuked their own HQ to protect their corporate secrets. But, as you might expect, the real story is nowhere near that simple. Apparently, Arasaka had managed to lock down Alt's digital consciousness and used her to build a new version of the Soul Killer, something that neither Militech or the US government could really let slide. The two joined forces and assembled the Black Ops team, headed by the legendary mercenary Morgan Blackhand, consisting of another merc named Rogue, a journalist called Thompson who actually writes for the Night City Inquirer in 2077, the Netrunner Spider, and, you guessed it, Johnny Silverhand, who was all too eager for both revenge and to attempt another rescue mission. The objectives were simple enough. Get in, rescue all, eliminate the Soul Killer, and then just drop a tactical nuke in the basement to destroy Arasaka's main corporate databases. Of course, this being cyberpunk, nothing goes according to plan, and everything goes completely to hell when Arasaka's favorite full-borg cybergoon Adam Smasher shows up and pumps a bunch of lead into Johnny Silverhand. Spider tries to back up his brain using some sort of data slug given to her by Alt, we're assuming this is the biochip that V eventually steals in 2077, but her equipment is destroyed in the firefight and the process fails. The team manages to burn out Soul Killer, but they can't save Alt from remaining trapped in the collapsing data net. By the time the bomb goes off, it's unclear who beyond Thompson, Rogue, and Spider are left standing. Though we do get a good look at Adam Smasher alive, uh, functioning, and well in 2077, so there's another one. Nor is it clear who is actually responsible for the nuke detonating ahead of schedule. In the aftermath of the blast that leveled most of the city center, the Militech-backed US government steps in with a force that Arasaka effectively couldn't match, and the Japanese government soon convinced the PMC to cease their operations. The years immediately following the war are remembered as the Time of the Red, due to a mix of debris and radioactive fallout circulating through the atmosphere and turning the sky a violent shade of red that didn't really dissipate for nearly a decade. The global balance of power shifts away from corporations and back to national governments, with laws being put in place to demand at least some semblance of accountability in the face of any corporate wrongdoing. With much of its industrial infrastructure destroyed or crippled, the world experiences something of a technological recession, with the production and development of cyberware taking nearly 30 years to return to the levels it was at in 2020. Now, this might have been quicker if the net was still around to share information, but after Bartmoss's data crash, it was so overloaded with rogue AIs and self-aware viruses that it was effectively written off as a digital wasteland. Sealed off behind a black wall by the Netwatch Agency as new local net hubs were being rebuilt. Amid all this, Night City, along with several others, rebuilt itself, thanks mostly to nomad supply chains and corporations looking to buy their way back into society's good graces. The new United States government failed to provide any meaningful aid, instead trying to leverage offers of assistance against the Free States' hesitancy to rejoin the Union. I bet you can't guess where this is going. This so-called reunification effort by the NUSA eventually became a war all its own, as the federal government of the United States tried to bring the Free States back into the fold. Night City found itself wedged in the middle, as Southern California rejoined the US and the Northern Free State refused, though it managed to avoid being drawn into the fight thanks to the help of an unlikely ally, Arasaka. The security giant had been all but banished from North America, but their arrival instantly made the feds back down from an escalation they knew they couldn't afford. A treaty between the remaining free states and the NUSA was signed, and Night City was designated an international free city, exempt from the laws of both the new US government and the free state of Northern California. To the immense delight of megacorps everywhere, not least of all Arasaka, who wastes no time setting up their new American HQ right on top of the ruins of the old one. And that pretty much brings you up to speed. 
The monitors might have changed from CRT to LCD, but Night City is once again a good old-fashioned hive of corporate greed and violent crime. Sure, there are still plenty of questions left unanswered, like exactly who grabbed up Johnny's digital consciousness when the towers fell, and what happened to Arasaka's real area denial move, because you know they definitely had one down there. Or, at the very least, has Kibble released any new flavors in the last 50 years? Be sure to check out all our coverage of Cyberpunk 2077 for the answers to most of those questions, or watch our interviews with the original tabletop RPG's creator and what we thought after spending 16 hours straight in Night City. For all your other edge-running needs, keep your data jacks plugged in right here at IGN.